Who's Angie? So this morning we are still um, mid-series. Um, in fact, we, we're still early in our series. What I want to do is, um, we try, uh, what I'm trying to do during this year is to build this series towards becoming or being a prevailing people. And again, we said that last year we were quite shocked to see that so many um, kind of mature Christians or seasoned Christians, probably the better word, people that have believed for a long time, actually uh, were quite shaken by COVID and by what went down. And so what we're building towards is a prevailing people, a prevailing church, so that when Jesus returns, he will indeed find faith in the, on the earth. And so the, the things that I want to use as building blocks is purity, prayer, presence, the power of the Holy Spirit, and then into prevailing. And so we are starting, we're still busy with the first part being purity. And today's message is called Purity Along the Way, Purity Along the Journey. But before that, I just want to position this, and um, because this is a this is a big deal in a sense. What I'm going to try to do today, firstly, the good news is I'm going to be short. I think brief. Um, I have, like always, five points. Just so that Mike Simon, I hope you're watching, um, doesn't get thrown by this. And um, but but the big thing is that. Um, you know, we can speak cognitively to someone's mind. And what we try and do is we want to go beyond cognitive speaking. I don't want to simply teach or share something or share five points. And by the way, these five points are incredibly elementary. You'll, you'll see in a moment. And uh, so it is not going to blow your mind. You're not going to feel, walk away and think, I've never thought of those five points. Uh, I could probably teach these in children's church. The one in marriage might be a bit difficult, but <laughs> anyway. The thing is, I want to get beyond cognitive. It's the old story from, you know, you speak to someone's mind, but you actually want to go to their heart. And I think that there's a problem with that. I think sometimes we, we want to give information and we want information to become revelation. And so we say you have to kind of Hit, hit the point hard enough so that you whack it from the head to the heart. I think we need to whack it even harder without whacking it at all. But that the Holy Spirit would take it from the head, through the heart, into the gut. Because I don't think it should stop in the heart. And this is, this is the reason for it. Because if it stops in the heart, you see, this is cognitive, this is mechanical, this is engineering, <laughs> like a cry, this is vilikis and reikis, but this is, very, is sometimes very emotional, this is my belief system, but my belief system can be quite tainted, because it's, 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 a, it's like a filter. Uh, do you have one of those reverse osmosis systems at home, or just a water filter at home? And sometimes you have to change those filters, and you cannot believe what comes out of that. This thing that you put in there personally or that the technician put in there and it's as white as this paper, a year later, it's as black as this. And, and it's, this is George. This is water. In any event, it comes through that filter system. The, the point, uh, it's a long introduction, sorry, I'm going to cut this. Um, I want to get beyond our belief system to actually get into a value system. Okay? Because our belief system... If I simply take it from cognitive to a belief system, you're still going to think of those same things through your belief system, and your belief system might be warped. And your belief system might still hold in it unforgiveness, hurts, wounds, failures, stuff. And so you see the truth through that belief system because we live, not cognitively, we live from, th from our belief system. So I actually want to break through that and have the... the the renewal of the heart, the renewal of the mind, but actually of the heart, the purification of the, of the belief system so that we can actually get to a value system. And so I want to go beyond the, the mind, beyond the heart, actually to the mouths and the hand, to a genuine belief system, or 
a value system because we live from a value system. Okay, did we get that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's. Oh God, I pray that this morning your Holy Spirit would come, would open up our minds and our hearts so that we will not simply hear, but that which we hear would be filtered not through our warped, hurt belief system, but actually become a new value system. I pray, Lord, that as we hear these things, that your word and your spirit will purify, will cleanse, and will heal our hearts so that our belief system and our value system can become the same thing. And so that, that which we do and say that comes from our, our gut, our, our hands and our mouths, actually is both our belief system and our value system. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So, purity along the way. History is the subject of men and women who have accomplished great feats during the course of history, somewhere in the past. They all started off well, and they've all accomplished something noteworthy, something remarkable. That's why they're in the history books. But not necessarily did they end off well. Um, you, uh, I am not going to waste time this morning highlighting names and the failures of history. Guys that started off well, did great things, and then is not necessarily remembered for whatever, or with, with great gusto or whatever. So, in fact, for each and every one of us, names can pop up as we sit here of people that actually, men and women from history, or men and women just from your, your past, Guys that you were at school with, that you thought, surely this guy is going to become one of the great sportsmen of our time, or this guy is going to become one of the great inventors of our time, and somehow, somewhere, something along the way derailed. People who had the potential, the desire, and even the opportunity to achieve greatness in their time, and yet somehow they were derailed. And you know what's even more amazing is that not, not only history, but I almost want to say, especially church history, is really riddled with the names with, and, and much sadness of those who did not prevail right to the end. You remember that I, I quoted Steve Farrar last week, Steve Farrar, the, the author of Finishing Strong, where he pointed out that for those who start off on fire in their 20s, on fire for God in mid-20s, only one in 10 statistically will still be serving the Lord at age 65. That is, is quite horrific. Another quote says, Sin will take you further than what you wanted to go. It will keep you longer than what you wanted to stay, and it will cost you more than what you were willing to pay. Sin will take you further than where you wanted to go. It will keep you longer than what you wanted to stay, and it will cost you more than what you were willing to pay. Now, purity, purity on the way. Purity is not an end in itself. Purity is, in fact, preparation for war. Purity is not just making sure that you don't go out with, you know, unbrushed teeth and, and clean nails. Purity is preparation for war. It is a strategy for war. It is armor for protection or provides armor for protection. And it deals with guilt and shame, raising up believer warriors for purity. So when I speak about purity, it is not a, a, uh, a cleansing program. It is not a bar of soap that I'm trying to hand out. I'm actually trying to hand out some swords. Okay, so this morning I want to use a couple of pointers that will become milestones on this journey of purity because as I've said, purity isn't a moment in time. It isn't one right decision. It isn't in fact, a decision at all, it is a decision, but it goes beyond a decision. It becomes a journey, and, it, and it's not simply a destination. It's a journey. The five things that I want to touch on is regular, genuine, intim, intimate encounters with Jesus Christ. Okay? So you can see this isn't going to be rocket science. Secondly, it is settled identity. Thirdly, healthy marriages. Fourthly, having real friends. And fifthly, actually being accountable. So those five simple things. Genuine encounters, regular, intimate encounters with God. Settled identity, 
healthy marriages, real friends, and actually being accountable. And so as I was preparing this, um, now remember, if you were here last week, I, I had to split last week's message into two, so this is the second half of the first, but fortunately they're both standalone, you, you'll be okay if you haven't seen the other one, heard the other one. Um, but suddenly I realized I'm heading towards 10 points on purity. And so as I did that, I realized that, that this could be a religious purity trap. Okay, hear what I'm saying. Uh, it can be the, the 10 points of do's and don'ts towards purity. If I tick these 10 points, I will live a pure life. Okay, in the good classic Greek, it could be Hebrew, I'm not sure. The word is? Rabish. Okay. So, the fact, the fact that I'm mentioning only the do's and not the don'ts made me feel better. I kind of felt, now it's not a rule book. Okay? So it's not a rule book because I'm only doing with, with the, the do's and not the don'ts. So it's not, don't, don't, don't. It's not, don't, 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 don't touch. Mini rock, ni smok, ni, and all of that. But actually, it can easily become a do, do, do thing. And so if you mishear me, you can end up feeling that I'm producing a list of works towards purity, a checklist for morality, this guy's religion which it's not. In fact, I do want to equip and release male and female kingdom warriors of purity. That's the point. So let's kick off with regular, intimate encounters with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. As elementary as this may seem, it is both most crucial and most neglected. It is the most amazing paradox of Christianity that that which is often most crucial in the Christian walk is often also most neglected in the Christian walk. And so, just well, last week, I touched on Zacchaeus. And we showed that how Zacchaeus, in a single encounter, how a single encounter with, with Jesus could change the heart and the life and the future of this man named Zacchaeus. And so we can think that a single encounter is all that I need. And some are praying for, just give me one encounter. The thing is that a single hearty meal, a single proper good meal, I don't care if it's a two kilogram steak, might see you through the day. But it definitely won't be enough for a lifetime. And so in past week, I've been reminding us of, of the devotion of the early church. In Acts chapter 2, verse 46, it says, Every day, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Acts 2, 46. So there's the sense of every day, this, this regular, continuous meeting together, corporately and from house to house. And so the way our connecting one another with, with families couples, singles. It's, just, it's more than just a good idea. It's more than just a, a helpful suggestion. It actually has the potential to see you through, to impact your destiny. And so, by the way, regarding the way, we are doing a second wave. We, we've thought to like, be led by COVID. Why not? Uh, everybody else is blaming everything on COVID. So, we, we are I'm not blaming it, but we are saying, well, if they can have a second wave, so can we. So um, we had the first wave of pairing and connecting people to walk together and to do Christian life together. And so we are doing a second wave because a lot of people were added to us and um, some of the, the previous pairings isn't quite um, jelling for, for different reasons. So we are doing a second wave of the way within the next two weeks or so. Just look out for that. But we're still on the, on the very first point of regular intimate encounters with the Lord. One would think if there's, if there's one person that shouldn't have had or shouldn't have needed regular encounters with the Father, it would be Jesus because he was constantly in connection with the Father. He said, I never do something which I don't see the Father doing I, or what I don't hear the Father saying. And so yet we read in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and went to a solitary place to pray, as was his custom. 
Is that remarkable? The one who needed to pray so little prayed so much. In Acts chapter 9, we have the, the account of the uh, conversion of Paul, then Saul. And it was probably one of, well, I think, the most radical encounter with God. If we're looking at single radical encounters, and obviously it led to his conversion, and yet he is the one, Paul himself, who keeps on writing back to the believers and back to every single church, and every time he, he picks up the pen or every time he dictates to a scribe, he's pointing them back to Christ, he's encouraging them to have regular encounters. And so he says in Philippians, to so the Philippian church, uh, chapter 3, verse 10 to 12, I want to know Christ. I just realized this guy is fully saved. It's not like he's crying out for salvation. He says, I want to know Christ. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. I want to become like him, like him even in death, so that somehow I would also attain to the resurrection from that death. Not that I've already obtained all of this. But one thing, or have been made perfect, but, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me for. So that's his, that's his chorus, that's his anthem. Regular, continuous encounters with a life-giving one. So ask yourself, as we conclude with this first point, how is my actual daily walk with God? How is my actual daily walk with Jesus? Not the one that I would like to have or that I think I have. Because you know what? Sometimes we can actually go days and I think sometimes weeks without reading the word for ourselves or by ourselves and actually intentionally praying ourselves. Sometimes I think without even realizing it. And it sounds impossible and yet it's true. Purity is not a decision, and it's not a destination. It's a journey. And this journey is simply not possible without the help of the Holy Spirit and without spiritual discipline. And when I mention spiritual discipline, I'm not saying works or striving, but I am referring to just good, regular meals, spiritual meals, to sustain you for the long run, to help you and I prevail as we have regular, genuine, intimate encounters with a life-giving one. Secondly, settled identity. So when I, when I speak about identity, I know I'm going back to rock bottom to day one, verse one, chapter one. If you've been here for longer than a month, you would have heard me preach on Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. It's a scene of the baptism of Jesus. It's the only place from Genesis to Revelation where we find the entire Trinity wrapped up in one spot. Because Jesus is standing there dripping wet. He's just come out of the Jordan. There's this, the Spirit in the form of a dove lighting on him. And there's the heaven opens and the voice of the Father. And he says three things. He says, this is my Son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Identity, unconditional love, approval, and acceptance. The thing is that only the Father, the Father of heaven, spiritually, but also the natural Father can bestow true identity on his sons and daughters as we come to the Father through Jesus, the Christ, through the Son. So Galatians chapter 3. Verse 26 to 27 says the following. You are all sons of God. For the ladies, just chill. It includes daughters. It's a short time that you'll be sons. For the rest of my life, I'll be a bride. For the rest of eternity. Okay? You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourself with Christ. Sons of God, sons and daughters of the Most High of the Father through Jesus Christ. The unfortunate thing is, and this is the point because we're actually talking about purity, and now I'm 
popping in identity, settled identity. And this is the point. The point is until we know who we are, we will easily live with wonky purity. Or let me rather read what I said. The unfortunate reality is until we know who we are in life, we will be very susceptible to compromise. Unless identity is settled, we'll be living susceptible to compromise. Because my identity determines my values. And therefore, insecurity regarding my identity, insecurity regarding my sonship or my daughtership will always always result in unstable, easily compromised values, which includes impurity. Because my values are determined by my identity. So fathers, our fathers here, fathers, please ensure that your own identity is settled in Christ. Go back to Matthew 3.17 and ask him to open that to you that you may have identity, love, and acceptance, and approval, and not living on comparison and, and competition and all of that orphan-heartedness. But once your own identity is settled, then it's your responsibility and privilege to settle the identity of your children through love and acceptance and encouragement and approval and trust. This, together with your own example is worth much more than any speech or any sex education that they will ever get. It brings security to them when you are settled in your identity and when you bring them into a settled identity of Christ, it brings them into security, which then in in turn settles both their identity and their values. And once their identity and their values are settled, you have created an environment for purity to grow and to flourish. Moving on. A healthy Marriage. Marriage relationship, we, we all know, is based on open and honest communication, regular, intentional communication. We, we all know this. I, I did mention that this wasn't going to be contain many wow factors this morning. And so this is, again, not a, a marital crash course this morning, but, but please guard your marriage because your marriage is a holy covenant before God. I had to take out some of what I planned to say here because it was rated, um, but maybe in the evening service. So note this, infidelity doesn't just happen. It is a slow maturing seed, but once it starts to grow, it can shoot up really quickly. It flourishes in the soil of limited communication, harsh words, and disrespect to one another. It is well watered with time apart and inappropriate looks, conversations, and fantasies regarding third parties. It blossoms in the emotional state of neglect, rejection, self-pity, or offense. While entitlement, surely I deserve some happiness, surely I deserve that. While entitlement ripens it to lust. And now the only thing missing is opportunity. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 27 to 29. says, can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burnt? I think it can get worse than just his clothes because he's scooping it into his lap. Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So he who sleeps, so is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. And this I know speaks to the men, but, but likewise, ladies, keep a careful watch over your emotions. Because as, mu- as much as men are stimulated, Visually, mostly, ladies need to guard their romantic thoughts and their fantasies, ensuring that the only one to fill your emotional tank is your husband. 
ensure, ladies, that the only one to, to fill your emotional tank is your husband. Spouses, please treat one another with dignity, respect, and honor. With tenderness, empathy, and care. With romance, intimacy, and passion. Marriage is the only place where purity requires passion. <laughs> Marriage is the only place where purity requires passion. If you're too passionate, you're not married, it's definitely not going to equal purity. <laughs> having real friends, having real friends, it's really important for both male and female, for all of us. And yet somehow it's easier, or it seems to me, just looking at it, it seems to be easier for, for the ladies to have friends, to make friends, to have lots of friends than it is for, for the men. And so I, I think that's because it, it requires openness. It actually op requires taking off the mask and, and the rest. So, so for the guys, I've mentioned real friends. I put that in there for a reason, just that word, real friends. Because just because the guy at the hardware store has sold you thousands of rands worth of power tools over the years does not make him your friend. Somehow, independence and, and pride has caused us as men to be mostly isolated. We're surrounded by other men, and yet we go through life wounded, lonely, and friendless. And so most men make major decisions carefully. Buying a new car. Um, selecting the perfect set of tires. Uh, things like selecting a fiber network provider. But then, when it comes to friends, it's a different story. It's the guy next door. Why? Because he has DSTV or a boat. <laughs> or it's, it's your, your work colleague. Or it's your brother-in-law. Why? Oh, well, because he was standing there. He was, he was my friend. So I believe for, for true friendship, for true, true friendship, there should be a desire for a fellow journey men. Okay? So to, real friends. If you're looking for real friends, look for fellow journey men. Men that you want to take on the journey with you. I believe that for some reason, T.D. Jakes has been quoting me regularly lately. So I decided to throw one of his in just to turn the favor. So T.D. Jake says, I know that you're my friend when you can guard my failures, when you can challenge my thoughts, and you can still celebrate my success. When you can guard my failures, challenge my thoughts, and celebrate my success. From T.D. Every man needs other men around him to bless him, to honor him, to point out his blind spots. <laughs> you know, it's so weird. People keep on saying, I have blind spots. <laughs> I just don't see them. <laughs> and to encourage him. So in the light of this, in the light of having heard this, who do you regard as your true, real friends? And then using some of these same criteria, are you a true, real, good, genuine friend to others? Lastly, actually being accountable to someone. Now, I know that this sounds a lot like my previous point. It, it sounds like, why do I have friends? But it actually goes further than just having friends to actually being accountable. We've just said that the ladies make friends easily. And so, most ladies, you, you might have more than a thousand friends on Facebook. You might have ten or more coffee shop friends. You might have ten or more book club friends. But you might only have one or two buying swimwear together friends. <laughs> so, these, aren't you amazed at my insight into the female psyche? <laughs> I am. <laughs> And these 
are the ones that you will open up to. These are the ladies that you will open up to regarding your marital status, regarding your concern about your husband's drinking, regarding your concern about your teenage, teenager's dark thoughts or friends. For the guys, Baba, steel, boil, steel balls and big tea are not the best choices to be your accountability friends. You are looking for someone that you can be open and honest and real and vulnerable with. Someone who has your best interest at heart. Someone who will listen to you and then also speak the truth in love. Someone trustworthy. Someone who wants you to succeed. Someone who wants to see you succeed. Someone who wants to go the distance with you. Someone who actually wants to be there at your 50th wedding anniversary. Someone who is therefore willing to ask you the hard questions when it becomes necessary. And that's it. That's my song for the day. Those simple five pointers on this journey towards purity. Now I know that I did not wow anyone here, I probably shocked some, but I did not wow anyone here with revelation. But I also know, and I can also guarantee that these points can make a heck of a lot of difference when it comes to going the distance as kingdom warriors, as kingdom warriors, men and women in purity, becoming, being, prevailing believers, being those who when Jesus returns will stand strong in their faith, who will prevail. Lord, this morning we thank you for simplicity. We thank you that the gospel isn't rocket surgery. We thank you that this is five simple points. And we pray that we would not turn it into a rule book, but that by your Spirit, And being dedicated to who you are, whom we are becoming, as Paul writes, to know him, to become like him, these things will be kept in mind in order to flourish in purity, to be the prevailing church. Amen.